Good morning again. Well, I am so delighted that uh, you guys aren't on vacation this morning and that uh, you showed up to here to worship with us today. And so I, uh, you know, during this uh, summer season, looks like the cream of the crop is here today. Thank you so much uh, for coming and being with us in our worship service today. We're going to conclude our series that we've been in for several weeks now. We've been walking through the book of 2 Timothy. And so today I want to talk to you about uh, the topic of how to stay focused. Let me share with you a picture up on the screen. Have you ever heard the story of Fadja Singh? Uh, in 2013, Fadja Singh, nicknamed the Turban Tornado, <laughs> set a world record. Here's what was reported, and I quote, Every excuse you've ever used to not get out of bed and run in the morning has just been trumped. Fadja Singh, at the ripe old age of 101, finished the Hong Kong Marathon's 6.25-mile course Sunday with a record time of 1 hour, 32 minutes, and 28 seconds. It went on to say, The Indian-born Singh... At 100, became the oldest man to run a full marathon when he finished Toronto's Waterfront Marathon in 2011. Singh began running at the age of 89 as a way to combat depression after his wife and son died in quick succession. From a tragedy has come a lot of success and happiness. This is what Singh said before the race. He also hopes his his um, good run continues past retirement, <laughs> and that people will continue to invite him to events rather than forget me altogether, he says, just because I don't run anymore. Well, believe it or not, as of this year, 2023, at the age of 113, he's about to turn 113, he is not forgotten, and he's still showing up at marathon events to... Uh, help kick off races, and to cheer on the other runners. You know, it's pretty amazing to me that anybody could finish a marathon at any age. But nothing short of amazing doing it at the age of 100 and 101. And just think, he started training when he was 89 years old. Perhaps... That's the most amazing part of the story, that he started at that age and stayed so focused that he could uh, have this incredible legacy of running that he's left behind. Obviously, he knows something about staying focused. And so today, I want to talk to you about another race, a race that we are all in. Every one of us who follows Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we're in a race. Paul talks about that. It's actually a marathon race. It's called the Christian life. And when that race ends, one day we want to be able to look back with pride and say, I ran the, way, the race well. I believe that's what the Apostle Paul is saying as he's, as he's writing this final closing chapter of his letter to Timothy. Second Timothy is actually a record of the last words the Apostle Paul ever wrote. And Bible scholars believe that most likely it was only just a matter of days, certainly a very short amount of time after he finished writing this letter that he sent to Timothy, uh, that he was executed and beheaded. Listen to what could be the epitaph on his tombstone. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And through it all, I have kept the faith. Now, it's quite interesting the analogy that Paul uses here, it's quite striking 
when he speaks of the time of his departure being near, he's actually using a naval term. He he's, talks about being on a ship, literally, um, in the Greek. And he says, I'm on a ship that is about to set sail for a distant land. And he's basically saying, I've already gotten on board. I've boarded the ship. There's no getting off. There's no turning back. He says, it won't be long. I'm going to leave this world for the next one. And all that I can do now is pass on to you the life that I've lived and maybe a few last words to encourage you and certainly my protege, Timothy, about how you can live a life and how you can run a race that one day leaves behind a lasting legacy. So we finish our study of 2 Timothy today. And as we do that, we want to see what the Apostle Paul can teach us as he writes these words literally sitting on death row. After having served as an evangelist, having served as a church planner, having served as a pastor for over 30 years, he has literally touched the lives of thousands of people. And he's coming now to the final chapter of his life. To me, it's interesting, one of the things that he says here is, it's a very telling statement. He says, let me tell you about one person that has stayed with me here to the end. 2 Timothy 4, 11, he says, only Luke. I'm at the end, and only Luke is with me. You know, it's um, a sad but a somewhat understandable thing that he's saying you know, he says, I'm here all alone in my cell except for one companion who has stayed here and continues to serve me. You know, being in prison in Roman days was not like being in a prison in America where they feed you three meals a day and uh, take care of all of your needs. If your family or if friends did not provide for you when you were in a Roman prison, you would starve to death. Because they, they would not provide. And I, as I think about him, he, he's actually commending Luke. Because Luke is doing a very brave thing to even be there. I mean, just imagine anyone who associates himself, not with just the Apostle Paul, but certainly with Christianity, is literally subjecting, subjecting themselves to arrest and jail time and possible execution. You know, Christians aren't winning popularity contests uh, at this time. And you have to commend Luke for his amazing courage and commitment. Luke is really very important. He's part of the story uh, do you know why he's so important? Not just because he was a physician who was highly educated, an obvious professional. Uh, he's important because he's one of the disciples, one of the twelve, the inner circle that Jesus picked, handpicked. Luke also wrote one of the New Testament Gospels named after him, the book of Luke. And he also wrote another book in the New Testament. Do you remember what that book is? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and he wrote the next book. Luke wrote the book of Acts. The book of Luke is a story of his experience having walked and ministered alongside Jesus. And so he's saying, here who Jesus is. Here's my perspective. Here's what I experienced. You know, here's what I, what I witnessed. Here's my testimony. But then he goes to the book of Acts, as he writes that book, you know, he, he says, here's the history of Jesus. But in the book of Acts, he says, here's the history of the church. And who is probably, other than Jesus, the most predominant figure that he writes about in the book of Acts? Do you know who it is? It's the Apostle Paul. Because he's actually telling you the history and the story of the Apostle Paul and all the churches that he 
started, the missionary journeys that he was on. And, and so it's a history of the Christian church in its early beginning. And so much of the book of Acts tells, tells us the story of Paul. It tells about Paul's prior life before he became a Christ follower. You know, there was a time when Paul's name was Saul. And he tracked Christians down just so that he could have them put to death. He was on a mission to extinguish uh, Christianity. And one day, while he's traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus, the Bible says with legal papers in his hand that would give him the authority to not only arrest Christians, but to literally have them put to death. Saul has a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ. And he falls on his knees and he repents right there on that dirt road to Damascus and he commits his life to Jesus Christ and he gets up a committed follower of Christ and goes on to become the most passionate evangelist that we have any record of in the New Testament. And Luke, in the book of Acts, tells us about the churches that he started. He tells us about some of the trials and the struggles that Paul had to endure, how he was beaten, how he was whipped, how he was stoned, how he was arrested multiple times, thrown into jail multiple times. And, and the question is, where, where did Luke get all of this information about Paul and his ministry? Uh, well, he got it firsthand from Paul himself. You know, after Paul became a Christian, his name was changed from Saul to Paul, and, and uh, it wasn't long after that, sometime in his ministry, as Paul begins to begin ministry, Luke begins to travel with uh, Paul. And I can just imagine this whole time because Luke is a consummate historian. He's interviewing Paul, and he's recording the details of all the things that he's experienced. And I can imagine as he's sitting there in Rome and he's visiting Paul every day, he's probably writing down a history of all the other things he may have missed or things that Paul may have wanted him to convey. And, and so a lot of what you read in the book of Acts is, you know, stuff that he, Luke has recorded firsthand from interviews with the Apostle Paul. I don't know about you, when he says, you know, Luke's the only one with me now, I am so thankful that Paul, after having touched the lives of so many people, literally thousands, I am so thankful that Luke is there by his side in his final hours, being what most all of us cherish in that time of our life, a true, loyal, committed friend. And so in 2 Timothy, we have Paul sharing the legacy of his life, commending Luke and others. And when we come to this final chapter, chapter 4, he's sending this message to Timothy. He's saying, I want you to live a life of commitment. I want you to live a life that leaves a lasting Legacy. I want you to be remembered because what you're remembered for will be the message that will go on long after you are gone. And so here we are today, over 2,000 years later, and we're still being challenged to live a life in such a way that we leave behind a Christian legacy also. So these words that are being written to Timothy are words that I believe he would be writing to you today and would want you to not only hear, but to apply to your life. So how do we live for God in such a way that we can leave behind a lasting legacy? Let me share with you four points that I get out of this closing chapter. The first thing I'd like to challenge you to do that I believe Paul is saying is speak up. Speak up. Share his story, Christ's story, and share your story. Uh, listen to what he says in verses 1 and 2. 
of chapter 4. He says, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. And be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. And do it with great patience. And do it with careful accuracy and instruction. Now, some of us might read those words. And you might think to yourself, well, praise God. This lets me off the hook. I'm not called to preach. You know, I know God hasn't called me to be a pastor. And he has certainly had to call me to be an evangelist. Well, I can assure you, you are not off the hook. <laughs> uh, you just can't write this off and say, well, you know, this doesn't apply to me because it wasn't written to me, and, and I'm not a preacher and I'm not a pastor. Well, friends, the application and the challenge applies to all of us, and he even makes that very clear as he goes through this last chapter that, it's for all of us, and that all of us have the responsibility to speak up, to tell the truth, to share the good news, to share his story, and ultimately share your story. You know, his story is one we, he says, you can't keep it to yourself. There are people in your life that only you can reach. There are people in your life that God wants you to share his story with. And Paul is reminding Timothy, and he's reminding us that Jesus is coming again. And that he's coming back ultimately to set up his eternal kingdom. And when he comes, he says he is going to judge the living and the dead. I mean, one day we're all going to stand before God, and, and he's going to ask us, why didn't you speak up? Why were you silent? Why didn't you share my story? Why didn't you share your story? So Paul's challenging us today. And, and I hope you hear this challenge. Speak up. Share the word. Preach the word. Declare the word. Share your story. To me it's interesting the caveat that he attaches to that challenge. He says, not only should you preach, should you share the story, he said, do it in season and out of season. He, he's saying to us, speak up. Be a witness when it's convenient. And be a witness when it's inconvenient. Share his story when it's welcomed. Share his story when it's not welcomed, when it's out of season. Speak up when it's easy. And speak up when it's hard. Just do it. Let people know the truth about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And let them know that Jesus is coming back again. Let them know that one day he's coming back as a judge and we're all going to stand before him, the living and the dead. Let them know that his story is a big deal. And they need to commit their life to it. Now, as he, as he gives this challenge, Paul is aware of something we all know to be true. When he says, do it in season, out of season, correct, rebuke. He's saying, people don't always like to hear everything we have to say. Have you discovered that? <laughs> Sometimes, if not most of the time, especially unchurched people, you know, they prefer to listen to people that tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. But that's what we have. We have a message that people need to hear. You know, and unbelievers, for the most part, aren't inclined to listen to us tell them about religion and tell them about Jesus or his resurrection and they certainly don't want us to tell them about judgment and certainly not sin. But in spite of that, notice what Paul tells Timothy, and I believe he's telling us. In verses 3, 4, and 5, he says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. They don't want to hear the truth. 
instead to suit their own desires, to hear what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Does that kind of sound like our culture today? (laughs) He says, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, to lies. But you, in spite of that, keep your head, don't lose it, don't lose your focus, keep your head in all situations and endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And I just want to remind you, how many of us who are Christians here, how many of you Christians here are called to ministry? How many of us? All of us are called to do ministry, to be ministers. And and even though people and, and our culture is inclined to turn us off, even though they make make it difficult, even though they may reject our message and don't want to hear, we need to speak up anyway. We need to tell the truth. Keeping quiet is not an option. Silence may be golden, but sometimes for a Christian, it's just plain yellow. We we need to speak up. We need to have courage. Don't be obnoxious. Be gracious. Be loving. But when you really love people, you share the truth. They need to hear it because truth sets people free, both now and eternally. And, and, and the final suggestion before I move to the next point is simply that share your story. Share yours. Tell people what God's done for you. When, when people don't want to hear you talk about, quote, religion and the Bible, there's something about when we share our story. When we share, let me tell you what God has done for me. Let me show you how he's made a difference in my life. Let me share how my life has changed. Let me share with you how I was before I met him. Let me share with you the difference now that I'm in a relationship with him. People are more receptive to that than to any other thing. And you know, and sometimes people can't hear what we're saying for seeing what we're doing. Sometimes our actions speak louder than words. And so you got to live it so that you can share it. But speak up and share your story. Get it? Good. There's a second piece of advice Paul has for us. Not only should we speak up, but we need to stand strong. He talks about enduring hardship, you know, Being a Christian and being a Christian who shares his or her faith can be a challenge. But he says, I want you to endure. Notice what he says in verse 5. He says, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship. Even when it gets hard, stay with it. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. He goes on to say this in verse 16. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my support. But everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. Now, we assume he's talking about being arrested here in Rome. I mean, he was arrested a lot of places, had a lot of trials. But whatever trial it was, and certainly if it was this one in Rome, he, he says, I'm all on my own. No one stepped up to my defense. You know, he says, my friends deserted me. They've turned their backs on me. And he says, I've been left to suffer alone, which surely made his suffering even more painful. You know, this is certainly sad, but on the other hand, I, it's somewhat understandable. 
because of what it could cost you to speak up and stand beside Paul. But notice how Paul handles it. I mean, he could have ranted, he could have raved about it, he could have called out these offending parties by name, he could have gone on social media and condemned them all, he could have simmered and stewed, he could have condemned and held a grudge, but he doesn't do that. He lets it go. He says, may it not be held against them. He's, he's saying, God, forgive them. He's moving on. I mean, where did he learn to forgive like that? Don't you think he certainly learned that from Jesus and what he had learned about him and his crucifixion? How did Jesus react when he was crucified and all the disciples fled in fear? What did Jesus say as he hung on a cross in Luke chapter 23, verse 34? Jesus looked down from the cross and said what? God send fire down from heaven and burn them all to a crisp. Is that what he said? No. I, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I think Paul certainly must have that in his mind. But I believe he had another experience in his mind as he's writing these words. Don't, don't hold it against them for what they're doing. I believe he had in his mind what is recorded in Acts chapter 7 involving a young Christian by the name of Stephen. You know, Stephen was arrested by Jewish authorities on trumped up charges for being a Christian and sharing his faith. And at his defense, when he's standing before the Sanhedrin in a trial, the Bible says that Stephen stood alone. And he presents his defense. He responds to the charges that are against him. And the Sanhedrin decides to put Stephen to death by stoning him. And here's what I'm sure was in Paul's mind. He had to be thinking about that. Acts chapter 7 beginning with verse 55 it says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And, and listen to what people did. It, like, it, it is, it, it's just like we're in the same culture today. And he says, at this they covered their ears. And yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him. Dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named who? Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed and Saul, Paul, is watching all of this. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And it goes on to say, in the very next verse, and Saul, Paul was there, giving approval to his death. Now here, Paul is facing the same kind of judgment. You know, before his conversion, Saul, or Paul, did his best to put to death anyone who called themselves a Christian. And here is Paul's first exposure to a Christian named Stephen. And while Stephen is being stoned to death, he's asking God to forgive the people that are killing him. And now Paul is having the same experience. He's about to be executed for his faith, and he looks around, and just like Stephen, he sees he's alone. None of his friends are there to help testify on his behalf or to speak up for him. Like Jesus... Like Stephen, Paul chooses to forgive those who are attacking him and those who have even let him down. You see, he, he refuses to carry unforgiveness and a grudge to his grave. You know, a lot of the suffering and disappointment and hurt that we experience as Christians, it's amazing how often it comes from people that are close to us. It may be intentional, 
But many times, the hurt we experience is unintentional. But regardless of whether it's intentional or unintentional, when it comes to offenses and hurts, we have a choice. We can hold a grudge or we can forgive. Now, forgiveness, is that a harder choice? Yeah, you mark it down, it is. But let me give you two reasons we should always choose forgiveness. Number one, choose forgiveness because it's the best thing you can do for yourself. When you're doing the right thing and serving God and you're getting attacked and criticized, choose forgiveness always. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. Have you ever heard this statement? Bitterness is a poison we drink while we wait for other, the other person to die. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? You know, when it comes to hurts and offenses, one of the most useful and most healing gifts that we can give ourselves is the gift of forgiveness. I mean, we need to do it. We need to forgive because it's right. But we need to also forgive because it's healthy. You know, when you don't forgive, what you're doing is that you're giving the person that you're directing your unforgiveness toward, you're giving them the power to continue to hurt you. It's like saying, hey, here's a bat, just keep beating me up. But when I forgive, it's the right thing to do, and it's the healthy thing to do. Get it? Not only should we choose forgiveness because it's the best thing we can do for ourselves, but number two, we need to choose forgiveness because it's the legacy you want to leave behind. You know, I don't know about you, but I want it to be said of me, he wasn't bitter. I certainly don't want it said of me, well, he, was, he always held a grudge. He was bitter right to the very end. You know, I hope it'll be said of me. I hope it'll be said of all of us. He excelled at forgiveness. There wasn't a bitter bone in his body. So I want to remind you that offenses may not be a choice, but bitterness is a choice. Get it? There's a third piece of advice, and that advice is stay focused. Keep your eyes on the prize. Notice what he says in verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. It's like he's going to give it to him in himself on that day. And not to only me, but also to all. So he's talking to all of us, to all who have longed for his appearing. I am so thankful that one day, each of us who loves Jesus Christ and follows Jesus Christ, have committed our lives to him, one day we're all going to stand before the Lord and we're going to be rewarded. We're going to be rewarded for our faithfulness. And the Bible says Jesus himself is going to hand us a crown of righteousness. You know, I don't know about you, but if I get to heaven and I could just hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think that would be all that any of us would need when we stand before him. That would be heaven enough. But here's how Paul puts this same challenge in one of his other letters. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, he says, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes, and when he does, he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. You know, the Christian life can be a challenge. Paul's saying it, it's a battle. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy being a Christian. You know, I always get frustrated when I hear people say, well, you know, just give your heart to Jesus and the rest of your life will be like a bed of roses because he'll just take away all your problems. And, you know, that's just not true. The Christian life can be a struggle. It's rewarding, but it's also challenging. You know, and there are going to be hurts. There's going to be offenses. There's going to be rejection. There's going to be unforgiveness. But every time we are faced with a challenge, we have a choice. 
We have the choice. Paul is saying to either give in to bitterness and to give in to your anger and doubt. Or we can keep believing, keep forgiving, keep trusting, keep serving, keep being faithful. And one day God will look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servants. I am so proud of you. You fought a good fight. You finished the race. You kept the faith. Well done, good and faithful servant. So he's saying to us, stay focused. Stay focused. God will reward you. Keep your eye on the prize, on the end result. Notice how he says this in the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We'll share in his glory if we share in his sufferings. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will one day be given to us and revealed in us. One day we're going to share in his glory. So friends, on this journey that you're on, this battle that you're in, don't lose sight of God. The prize. Get it? Last of all, Paul says to us, stay connected. Don't don't do this thing alone. Don't try to do this solo. Stay connected. If you want to leave a lasting legacy, don't go it alone. Not for your sake and not for the sake of others. There is power in in community. We all need other people in our lives. The Christian life is about relationships. Relationship with people who know the Lord and relationship with people who don't know the Lord. We, we encourage each other in the family of God and we reach out to those that aren't in the family and we seek to bring them in. Don't go it alone. Listen to some of the things that Paul has to say to Timothy, beginning with verse 9. He says, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. I mean, he's asking for help. He's asking for companionship. Sometimes, you know, we don't have relationships because we don't ask. We don't make any effort. He goes on to say in verses 10 and 11, he says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Then he goes on to say in verse 21, he says, Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Snoopy, and Charlie. No, I'm sorry. I got distracted. So does Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. You know, he finishes this whole chapter talking about all these relations, and I haven't given them all to you. Matter of fact, he lists 18 different people uh, in this last chapter. You know, in America, we pride ourselves on self-sufficiency. You know, we, we have like a Rambo mentality. We often think that asking for help is a sign of weakness. Paul is sitting here on death row. Executioners could come at any time. And he so much wants to be connected with people that he loves and that he knows loves him. And when you read, you know, this last chapter, there's 18 different people he refers to. And most of them are people that he's had this great relationship with. And this list of people teaches us a couple of valuable lessons. Here's the last two lessons I want to close with. Number one, when it comes to people and ministry, number one, not everybody we work with is going to stay the course. Some of the greatest disappointments that I've had in my life are people that I've invested my life, my time, I've been in a a meaningful relationship with for an extended period of time, and then I see them fall off the wagon or they go a different direction, and, you know, and it just breaks your heart but that's part of ministry sometimes people just don't stick that doesn't make you a failure that doesn't mean you've done anything wrong that's just one of the challenges of 
being in relationships. You know, notice what he says in 2 Timothy 4.10. He says, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. You read about Demas the first time in the book of Colossians, and he's commending Demas. and Talk about what a big help Demas is and the assistance that he gave. He talks about him in a positive light. But here's the same person, and we're being reminded, well, not everybody sticks. Sometimes people just don't make it. People that you've even invested your time and energy into. But friends, that's God's responsibility and not yours. Get it? He also tells us, number two, this lesson when it comes to relationships. We can't help everyone that we try to help. But I would add, don't stop trying. (laughs) Get it? Notice he says in verse 20, he says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. You know, it's interesting, one of the gifts that Paul had was the gift of healing. I mean, in his story, there are times he prayed and people were healed. And so God had given him this gift, but apparently he couldn't heal everybody. And I get the sense as he writes this sentence that he feels very bad about leaving Trophimus sick in Miletus. He, he probably prayed over him. He probably prayed for God to heal him. But God didn't. God had another plan. And here's the lesson. No matter how hard we try, we can't heal everybody. And there'll be some people, as much as we try, we can't help. That doesn't mean you are a failure. That doesn't mean that you stop trying. Because for every Demas who deserts the faith, and for every Trophimus that we leave sick, there's many more like Timothy and Luke and Mark and Priscilla and Aquila and Hundreds of others whose lives will be touched that you will leave a lasting mark on because you took the time to love them, to be in a relationship with them, to pray for them, to encourage them, and you spent time with them. So here's the bottom line. If you want to leave a lasting legacy, then connect your heart and connect your life to as many people as you can and stay connected. Do your part to love people unconditionally and deeply and share the gospel with as many people as you can. And one day when you stand before God face to face, you will hear him say, well done, thou good and perfect, no, faithful servant. You have kept the face. You have finished the race. I am so proud to call you my child. Amen? Get it? Then let's do it. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, today I pray that you would encourage every person here today who has a relationship with you to stay focused, to stay the course, to continue the race. And God, even if they feel like others have failed or others have deserted, I pray, God, that we would keep our focus on Jesus and the ultimate prize. May we continue to stay motivated by the fact that one day we're going to stand before you and you're going to give us reward. You're going to give us praise. You're going to share your glory with us. And God, when we get there, we'll say it's been worth it all. Especially if we can hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so, Lord, if there's someone here today that is a Christian, but they've gotten discouraged, or maybe, Lord, they've kind of backed away from the faith, or maybe, Lord, they're not exactly where they ought to be in their walk with you, God, would you help them to realize that you love them unconditionally and that you're a God of fresh starts and new beginnings. And, God, I pray for someone today, they would have a new beginning. They would make a fresh new commitment. And Lord, I pray that all of us together would make a commitment. God, with your strength, with your power, we are going to stay the course and we're going to stay focused. 
And God, we're going to thank you that one day we will stand before you to be rewarded. And may we all hear you say, well done, well done, faithful servant. Lord, if there's someone here today that's not a Christian, Lord, I pray that in spite of the challenge of becoming a Christian, I pray, God, they'd realize that they need a relationship with you. That, God, one day they're going to stand before you and you will be a judge. But, Lord, I pray that today they would realize how much they need you. I pray, God, they would call out to you right now and say, Oh, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on a cross, paying the price so that my sins could be forgiven and paid for. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. And all of God's people said, amen.